amazing. Later on, I met uh, Father Atanasio Dupilinelis and uh, Father Ephraim, but again, I was so inspired by you know the work of Father, I mean, of Dr. Paul Agustinos Candiotis that I made it to Florida at least three, four times, and he was, he was at least 100 years old at the time. So, it's been a wonderful journey for the last 30, 32 years. And again, it's a great pleasure to be here in Australia and say a few things that uh, hopefully will make sense because this is the preparatory period of our church, the, the preparation for Great Lent, the time of the church called Toyovio. And as you, most of you know these things, but there might be a few people here that are not as a word. Toyodio has three different periods. The first period is from the Sunday of the tax collector and uh, the Pharisee, and uh, it goes all the way to Great Lent, to Clean Monday. The second period of Toyodio goes all the way to Palm Sunday, and the third period is Holy Week, and it ends on Holy Saturday. Now, Toyota is a book. It's really the book of the church that has all the humanology that we hear during the Lenten season for the next 70 days. And then after the resurrection of Christ, the church will use another book called Pentecostalion, which comes from the or Pentecost. So during these days, the church and the church fathers strategically take some scriptural lessons out of the gospel to teach us the main themes and the main things needed for our salvation. Repentance, forgiveness, metania, all these wonderful things that we need to become Christ-like or God-like. The essence of the Christian struggle is for us to recognize our purpose, to recognize that we were created in the image of God, and we, we need to go from the image to the likeness. We need to become Christ-like and God-like. And, of course, most of us don't do so well at that because, as I'm going to speak a little bit later, we have two different selves. We have our real self, the self that was designed and created by God, and we also have our self-image, the one that we create according to our passions and according to the worldly demands. So the purpose of our lives is to become sanctified, to become holy. God says become holy because I am holy. And one way to do that is to be free from our passions. As we say in the Apolitikion of the Plague of Fourth Tongue, I don't know if there's any chanters here, but I do a little bit of chanting here and there. Exipsus catilte soes platnos ta fin catedexo trinas, in alefteros simas compathon, is zoike yanastas simon ilia doxasi, and I will translate, you descended from on high of compassionate one, and condescended to be buried for three days, so from our passions you set us free our life and our resurrection, Lord, glory be to Thee. So our passions keep us enslaved to the tyranny of the demons, in bondage to the prince of this age, regardless of what today's libertarians may want to think. The world today resembles the waters of Jordan River, the world is headed towards the Dead Sea. And blessed are those Orthodox and those people of God 
that learn to free themselves and sanctify themselves with the pure waters of the Holy Spirit. So the themes of the, again, the great Lenten season is to take us from our fallen state, to heal us and resurrect us, so we can truly be resurrected with Christ during Pascha Sunday. It's a journey. It is not, we don't become different from one day to another. It is a struggle. That's why Christ says metanoite, not metanoisete. Continue to repent on a daily basis. Try to improve yourselves on a day, from day to day. <clears throat> so we were warned last Sunday to avoid the pride of the Pharisee and to emulate the humble spirit of the sinful publican. And we heard at the end of that parable, For anyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. So all the good works of the Pharisee were polluted and became Zero. They became nothing and odious to the Lord because of his passion of pride, criticism, and vainglory. They became rubbish. So our philanthropy, our good works, are not helpful to us and even sinful if they don't have the stand of humility. And let's pay attention to this paradox. The highly dignified Pharisee, the highly dignified men, the religious men of that age, went up to the temple full of godly works. And his counterpart, the despised tax collector, went up to the temple full of sins and crimes for humanity. And God rejected the good man and justified the sinner. And rightly so, because God did not recognize anything that belonged to him in the heart of the Pharisee. Not a trace of grace of the Holy Spirit. The Pharisee was an agnostic. People think that an agnostic is someone who, you know, doesn't go to church or someone who doesn't uh, care for God or doesn't even, you know, think that God exists. That's not necessarily true. The church fathers call an agnostic someone who doesn't have a living experience of God, who doesn't have experiential knowledge of God. So this Pharisee did all the externals, but his heart was, was hard as stone. He became his own idol. We say in the canon of St. Andrew, I became my own idol. And a lot of people do that, they worship themselves. Humility, love, compassion, mercy, and forgiveness for the sinner did not belong to the vocabulary of the Pharisees, let alone in their hearts. The tax collector, on the other hand, found rest. Christ said, come to me, all of you who are weary and laden and tired and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. The tax collector this past week and Zacchaeus the week before did just that. They took their heavy burdens and placed them on the shoulders of the Lord. They humbled themselves and they were not only given rest, 
but they were exalted. Exalted indeed. The prayer of the publican became the very basis of the most beloved prayer of our monastics. And all Christians, Lord have mercy on me, a sinner. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, ended his life as a bishop of the church. So in tomorrow's gospel, we will be touched once again by the most profound parable of the prodigal son, a tremendous account that shows the attributes of God, God our Father, and how he relates to his children. In this most popular parable that all of you know quite well, we have five different entities, five different personalities, but the protagonist is not the younger son who touches all of us by his depraved return, but the protagonist is the father, symbolic of our father in heaven. So we have the father, the two sons, the younger and the older. We have the swine farm owner who employed the bankrupt young son for a bed, and the servants of the father. So a parable is a picture. It's a pictorial teaching. It uses imagery to teach and touch upon human downfalls, to help us avoid these downfalls of some of the people, and also to imitate and emulate some of the good actions of some of the other people. The parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, has been inspiring humanity for 2,000 years. How many hospitals, nursing homes, clinics are named after the Good Samaritan? Millions. Or the parable of the rich men and Lazarus, the parable of the ten virgins. These parables and the gospel as a whole has fashioned the morals of Western society and Western civilization at least up to this past century, whether people want to realize it or not. Likewise, the wealth and the depth of this God-given parable of the prodigal son Parabolito Asotu, the death is immeasurable. In a few simple words, it captures the entire plan of the gospel, the entire plan of divine economy. It perfectly shows and elucidates the plight of today's society, a society that distances itself from God. The distancing from God and the enslavement of humanity to a life of swine is what we see today. Oh no, I, I take that back. I need to apologize for, this, for these innocent animals. I think they will be offended today by today's corrupt politicians and political incorrectness who are educating our young generations to accept lifestyles much, much worse than swine. So forgive me for this, <clears throat> but when a person or a man walks away from God, his mind becomes either demonic or beastly. Demoniodis or theodios in Greek. So in this parable, we see the drama of a young and ignorant man who thinks he knows much better than his parents. In this parable, we see that the depths 
the depths of the human soul cannot be satisfied from carapods, from harupia, from material wealth, and from carnal pleasures. All these things were vanity, they are vanity according to the wise Solomon. We will see the key to repentance, the unconditional love of God the Father, who sacrificed the fatted calf to feed his broken and hungry son. We will also see that our ungodly passions of anger, jealousy, criticism, pride, and selfishness condemn us to a life of misery, heartlessness, and make us reject and refuse the life of God and the life in paradise. The older son is symbolic of the people of Israel who refused to enter the church of Christ, the house of God, because they wanted their God for themselves and not for the Gentiles. They didn't want the God to go to the nations. They wanted a Messiah only for themselves. So a father had two sons, and the younger one said one day, Father, give me my share of the estate. I don't want my share when you die. I want it now. I want it now. And of course the father tried to convince his son otherwise. But when he saw that his son could not be convinced, then his father gave in because God respects our freedom. So not too many days after that, the young son cashed out the portion of his estate, took it, and went to a far away country, all the way to Australia. Oh, no, I'm sorry, yes, New Zealand, New Zealand. Okay. It's much farther. And there, he wasted his possessions with prodigal living, zon asotos, zon asotos, living in a way that would cost him his salvation. That's what asotos means, one unsaved. So he wasted his money. He made some friends who told him, let's do some things with your money. Gambling is a great idea. You can double your money. And from what I understand, our brothers and sisters, our Greeks here in Australia, have quite a reputation for gambling. So after he squandered his money, he began to starve. And what happened to his friends? They didn't know him any longer. He began to be homeless. He was on the street. And in order to satisfy his hunger pangs, he took a position with a swine master, someone who had a farm of pigs a farm of swine, and he was trying to satisfy his hunger from harupia. Harupia is uh, symbolic of sin. Once you eat it, it's sweet for a few minutes, but after a little while, it, live, it leaves a very nasty taste in your mouth. So he became very poor. He wasted God's blessings. And it was we sing in the church during Artoplasia service, Pelusia Tokevsan ke Pinasan, Ide Exitundes Tonkilion, Ukelatothison de Pandos Agathu.
those who seek the Lord, rich men, rich men became poor and hunger, but those who seek the Lord will never lack any good thing. So he went and joined himself to a ruthless master, to a farmer of swine. He became enslaved to the master of his demonic, demonic passions. Behind all our passions is the energy of demons. The church fathers say that behind every passion is a specific demon. The demon of fornication, the demon of lust, the demon of gluttony, the demon of pride, the demon of depression. And of course, what led him to all this? The passions of youth. And not necessarily the youth, but the passion of philidonia, love of pleasure, and combined with a passion of philargeria, because the one feeds and supports the other. We need to make a lot of money so we can spend it on our passions and pleasures. And this was the idea of the young man. This was going to make him happy. And that's why he needed to be away from his father so, you know, he couldn't get any kind of reproof, any kind of elemental from his father. So this is the devil. The devil is a cruel master. Initially, he whispers, go ahead, you're very smart. You can do it. You don't need your parents. You don't need to listen. You don't need the church. You don't need any of that. Enjoy your life. Life is short. And after we go bankrupt, then he sings a, a different tune. He said, Ah, Christos, you are worthless. You are worthless. Look at you. Look at you. You wasted everything. You know, Take a rope or a gun and finish yourself off. This is the work of the demons, the work of the devil. Thank God his thoughts did not occupy the mind of the younger son of our parable because of the noble character of his father. He thought to himself, now my father was respectful to my insensible wishes, to my rebellious wishes. How can he not be respectful to my good wishes now that I'm coming to my senses? And this is very important. When our children are not listening and they are ready to rebel, it is very important how to treat them at that moment. It is a critical mistake to make statements such as, listen to me, if you leave this house, there'll be no open door for you. If you do this now, don't ever come back. Terrible mistake for a father acting out of anger. And we see the results in Hollywood in different areas. Children who never return home. But this was our Heavenly Father. And what saved this young man was the holy images, the respect that he had for his father, regardless if he rebelled against him. He was aware of the goodness and philanthropy of his father. So the spark of hope gave him courage to come to himself, to come to his senses. The Greek beautifully says, Elthon is elthon. He came to himself. Now we ask, 
Where was he before he came to himself? He was far away from his real self. So it becomes obvious from this, from this parable, that many times in the journey of our life, we have at least two selves. We have our genuine and authentic self and our artificial or false self created by our desires and passions. This reality of the real self and our false or imagined self can be seen in many verses in the New Testament. St. Peter speaks about the hidden men of the heart. The hidden men of the heart. Or our inner self, our deep heart. That we don't know. We don't know ourselves. Even Socrates and the ancient Greeks would say, Know thyself. Aftognosia. It's extremely important for the spiritual life. St. Paul also speaks about the external man, our external prosopion, our external mask. Why do the people go to Carnavalia, to these hard of ancient Greeks, which are idolatry? They are heathen practices. Why do, why do they put masks on themselves? So they can act like animals. So the other they don't have to look at their real self. St. Paul speaks about the external men, our external mass, which needs to become renewed. Society and its demands force us to develop the necessary self-image. So we can fit in. So we can be cool. Right, kids? Did you say cool here in Australia? Do you? The Americans say, uh, you know, that everybody wants to be cool in America. What do you say in Australia? The same thing? Of course they watch American TV, yes. <laughs> so does Nicoletta, you know, uh, my nephew's uh, daughter. Is Nicoletta here? Okay. okay. St. <clears throat> Paul in Romans says, I have the St. Paul. St. Paul says this. I have the law of the bad self inside of me that brings me to the captivity of sin. Even though I delight in the law of God, it's like I have two people inside of me that are fighting against each other. My mind says, this is no good. What you're doing is no good. This action will destroy your life, or will destroy your family. This is the voice of the good self. But when the heart is enslaved to a specific passion, when the passion enslaves the noose, which is not the brain, it can be the brain too, but the noose is actually the, the soul of the soul. I mean the, uh, the eye of the soul. When the passion enslaves the noose and logic becomes dysfunctional, then a cocaine addict, a crack addict, or any kind of a criminal, they know that you know this is going to destroy them, this is tyranny, but they cannot stop it because of this enslavement. Unfortunately, we're all often enslaved and victimized by such tyrannical passions. When our passions enslave us, we regrettably do horrible things. And then we come to ourselves and ask, how did I do such a thing? How, how did I manage this? Well, you were beside yourself. That's your, that's your false self, the self of the fallen man. 
So many are those who misunderstand our faith. They misunderstand the gospel. They don't understand all these denials and all these don'ts, don't do this, don't do that. We say these no's to our bad self so it can heal our artificial self, which turns us into monsters. You know, we have a saying with the American Indians, they say something similar, because human nature is the same. Everybody who is in the, in the image of God, they have the struggle, not just the Christians. The grandson goes to the American Indian grandfather and asks, Grandfather, sometimes I feel there like there's two wolves inside me inside of me, two wolves fighting each other. And I don't know which one is going to win, the good one or the bad one. And he says, son, the one who's going to win is the one who you feed the most. Stop feeding the bad wolf and he will die. Stop feeding those snakes inside of you and they will die. That's, what, that's exactly what Christ says. When he says, deny yourself, he means exactly that, not deny your life. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Deny his artificial, false, bad and ungodly self. And that's just exactly what I said. Deny feeding that bad wolf, that monster inside of us. And then Christ says, whoever desires to save his soul must lose his life. What life? His artificial life, his false life, the life of the world, the life of passions. Because this kind of life will lead him to be like the prodigal son. So whoever loses this false life of the world for my sake will find the true life. He will find his authentic and genuine life. The life of meekness and humility and peace and serenity. All these things that we want, but we can't have, but because we don't know how to get them. So the broken young man came to his genuine self. Finally, after years of spending all the usia, all those gifts of the Father, he humbled himself. He realized that he made a huge mistake and said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I'm here starving to death. I will get up and go to my father, and I will tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me one of your servants. At least I'm going to have enough bread to eat. And he put this great thought of repentance into immediate action. And he arose. The Greek says Anastas. Anastas. He resurrected himself. Anastas, he got up, he arose and came to his father. Now we said earlier that the protagonist of this parable is the father who is symbolic of our father in heaven. Now once again, how did the father act when he saw this wreck of a son coming towards him? When he recognized his younger son, what would we do in that situation? We 
But some of us say, so, well, you decided to come back, huh? What happened to your great ideas? What happened to the money that you took? You doubled it? Where is it? You thought of me and your home now that we're broke. Didn't I tell you? You thought you knew it all. It serves you right. Now you'll work for the rest of your life so you can pay me back. That's human justice, right? I mean, that. So do we, a lot of us would do, unfortunately. This is what most of the world, people would say, if not worse. And this is what human justice demands. Because we, all, we often act out of human anger and egotism. But the father of this young man is the God of love, compassion, and mercy, who never stopped for a second loving his son. He waited for him day after day. And when he was still afar off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and got that feeling, not just kissed him. He was kissing him over and over and over again, like you couldn't get enough of him. What a beautiful image of the Christian God. Not the God of the West who becomes angry. Not the God of the West, the God of the Crusaders who becomes angry when we sin. That is not the Orthodox God. That's not our God. This is where we see the attributes of our Orthodox Christian God. There's a heresy in the Western Church that teaches that God became so angry with Adam and because God is infinite, he needed an infinite person to die so he could be satisfied. This God is a monster. And no wonder a lot of the Protestants become atheists when they teach him things like this. And a lot of them are becoming Orthodox. Thousands are becoming not only Orthodox, but monks and nuns in America. We have 700 monks and 600 of them are non-Greeks, and they all speak Greek. Did you hear that? They all speak fluent Greek in the monasteries, my father of friend in America. Okay, that is the language of the monasteries, because the Greek language is the language of the gospel, not because we're Greeks. No, no, no. You know, we're not uh, ethnophiletics here. But Father Florovsky said, and it's true, that if you don't understand Greek, then you cannot fully understand theology. So the Father was kissing him all over. He didn't wait, he didn't wait for him with his wrist clenched around his waist. He didn't hesitate. He ran to embrace his lost son. So God is not a policeman. He's not waiting for you to do something wrong so he can clobber you. That's not our God. He's not a security guard to go out there and punish everybody who does sins and burns forests and do whatever they do and, you know, and go on. God is not like that. God gives people time to repent. God is love and full of compassion for his children. And the son, because he came to his genuine self, 
He did not take advantage of the stance of his father. The son became real after all this affliction, all this pain. You see why sometimes God allows some pain in our lives? Pain makes us human. It makes us humble. It makes us understand the other person. When we have our health, when we haven't had any pain, and of course everybody has pain. There's not a single person without pain in this life. But when we do not have a lot of afflictions, then we cannot understand the other person. Pain makes us more human, humble, and real. So this young son, again, did not take advantage of the stance of his father. He didn't begin to make up stories, excuses. Oh, Father, the economy went bad. Some evil people fell upon me on their way home and they robbed me and so on and so forth. I had all the money, but you know, they just took it from me. He assumed full responsibility for his actions. and validated his true repentance by confessing his sins to his father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be your son. This is a perfect example of repentance and confession, necessary for the therapy of the soul. Some people, a lot of people, go to confession but they don't have any repentance. And some others repent, but they never go to confession. In this parable, Christ shows very clearly that if we want to begin a spiritual life, we cannot do so without repentance and confession to his representatives because right before the resurrection, Christ said very clearly to the apostles. He blessed the apostles and told them, receive the Holy Spirit. And he says that you forgive here on earth, are forgiven in heaven. And any sins that you don't forgive and you bound here on earth are bound in heaven. Christ says this. So Confession is a Christ-instituted mystery and necessary for our salvation. <clears throat> the wonderful thing is, the Father, out of His great love in His heart, He did not let Him say the last part. What was the last part? Let me become one of your servants. The father closed his mouth. He didn't have the heart to hear his son say such a thing. The heart of the father couldn't bear to hear his son express such words. He simply let his son confess his fault which validated his repentance. And that was enough for the Father. And without any words of correction to his son, now son, okay, fine, you know, come on, come on back, but yeah, I want you to be careful, don't you ever do this again, you know, da, da, da. none of that. <laughs> Nothing. Without any words of correction. We say in America, uh, when the horse is down, that's not the time to beat it, okay? You know, that's not the time. We have to have discretion. The time to instruct, you know, when your son, your son comes home, your child is already broken, tyrannized, give him a meal, some sleep, and talk to him the next day, not at that moment. Let him sleep, let him rest. Talk later. These are wonderful lessons of fatherhood and parenthood, right, in this parable. 
we need to pay attention to this. For one, you know, to develop strong children that are going to respect us, regardless if they make their mistakes and faults. So the father says, calls the servants, and he orders a celebration to beat all celebrations. He tells them, go ahead and grab their fatted calf. And there was all kinds of joy in the house. And the servants of this parable are the holy angels of God. The holy angels who celebrate at the return of every one of us sinners. The Bible says that there's great joy in heaven when one sinner, one lost sheep, returns back to God. So let's eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. My son was dead. His soul was dead and unresponsive to his heavenly purpose. The father didn't care about the lost money. The lost money is not an issue because nothing is as valuable as the human soul. Christ said the human soul, every human soul, is more valuable than this universe. Now it would be great if the story would stop here. Then we would have a very happy ending and my talk would be shorter. Unfortunately, the older son, the good son, the reputable son in this parable, the phronimos, the wise son by external standards, who never left home, would prove to be much more prodigal than the first son. Now his other son was in the field, he was working for the father. And as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called the servants and asked, what's going on? What's this all about? What, what happened here? The servant says, did you hear? Your younger brother came home and this made your father very happy. His return is the cause of all this great celebration. The older son did not share in the happiness of the father. His, be his behavior was diametrically opposite to that of his father. He became bitter and angry and refused to join the celebration of his, of his home. He refused to enter the house. When the servants told him, when the servants told the father, look, your son is not coming in. The father once again had every right to be upset with this terrible attitude of his older son. But the good father was not other again, not other than the good shepherd, condescended once again. He exited the house to go and plead and try to win and reason with his disenchanted older son. Because God loves all his children. He doesn't want to lose any of them, regardless of sins and shortcomings. But this action of the father did not touch the hardened heart 
of his older son. His bitterness and anger turned into a verbal attack against not only his younger brother, but his father as well. And the church fathers comment on this. They say, listen to this paradox, to this strange thing. The younger prodigal son returned from a life of sin and prodigality, and in a few moments after one sentence, Father, I have sinned against you. After one sentence, he entered paradise. The older son came from the field where he was serving the father. And instead of entering the house celebration, he chooses the hell of his anger and bitterness. The love and compassion of the father for his younger brother, instead of giving him joy, it became his hell. The same love of the father which became a source of joy and celebration for the young son, it became the source of anger and bitterness for the older son. The father once again did not reprimand his older son, but while pleading with him, the older son put on a display of his Pharisaic false self, a self that had nothing in common with his father. Again, another agnostic. He lived in the house of the father, but he never understood anything about the nature of his father. He had zero joy, no compassion, no love, no nostalgia for his little lost brother. He never shared in the pain of his father, who was sighing day after day, living with this daily pain of his lost son. Years ago, outside of Athens, in the uh, province of Gifisia, some desperate parents wrote a big sign on a wall. Our son, please come back, please come back. We miss you. They became desperate and wrote this graffiti on this wall. This is the pain of the parents for their children. But the older son was clueless because an egotist cannot love. An egotistical person cannot love. He only loves himself. The greatest illness is the illness of the demons. It's egotism, egoismos. And that's why without humility, which is the opposite of egotism, we will not see the face of God. But worse yet, he began to attack his father and accuse him of injustice and favoritism. He says, I slaved for you, I worked for you all these years. I did everything right. I never crossed you. I kept all your commandments. And you never gave me a small goat to party with my friends. What kind of father are you? And now, when this son of yours, not my brother, uh -uh, this son of yours, he already killed his brother inside of him. This no good son of yours who devoured your livelihood with harlots. How did he know? Was he there? How did he know this? He accuses him but he's in paradise he accuses the younger son but the younger son is in paradise 
We have to be very careful of this detail. Yes, we hear of people that sinned, that did horrible things in the past, and we keep talking about them. How do we know they're not saints right now? We hear of priests who made mistakes. Yes, they're human beings. They made mistakes, they made a mistake, and we continue to speak about this priest, or any priest. How do you know that this priest is not in paradise right now, and you are closing yourself out because you are taking God's judgment in your hands. You're grabbing something that belongs to God, which is judgment of other people and his people. So that's why criticism, kotsomoyo, in Greek. In Greek, they call Facebook kotsombola. <laughs> okay. Now I ask you, do you see any similarity here between the heart of the older son and his father? Absolutely not. Total absence of humility, forgiveness, compassion, love. The father was pleading with him and tried to reason with him, but he will ultimately refuse to enter the paradise of his father because he hates his brother. St. John says, he who hates his brother is a murderer. And anyone who says that he loves God, but he hates his brother, is a liar. My brothers and sisters, we're all guilty of this offense. We all have a person or two in our lives that we cannot stomach for whatever reason. This alone is enough to separate us from God eternally. Because God will plead with us to come into his paradise, just like he did with this older son of his. And we will say to him, no, 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 I'm not coming in until you throw out that and that and that person. I'm not going in the same room with them, Right? It's exactly what the older son did, did he not? So I'm not coming in your house, I'm not coming in paradise. So ultimately, it's not God who's going to judge us. We'll talk about Sunday of Judgment next Sunday in Melbourne. But the judgment takes place by our actions. We judge ourselves. We judge ourselves. The older son, unfortunately, is symbolic of most of us church people today. We may work for the church, we may attend church Bible classes, but we never make it a point to imitate the life, the life of the Father. When things get difficult, when we become accused, when we become slender, then we attack and we become just like the older son. Christianity, my friends, is the imitation of Christ. It's not just a rule of regulations. That Christianity is about producing fruits. Christianity, it's about developing the mind of Christ, the virtues of Christ, and the heart of Christ. This older son, like most of us, excelled in the externals, but he had no fruits of the Holy Spirit. He was like the fig tree on Holy Monday night that was cursed by the Lord. For just having leaves, 
It's not enough just to have leaves. We have to have fruits. That's what makes us Christians. Fruitfulness. Meekness, humility, compassion, love and philanthropy. Not just for those who like us and are good to us, but even for our enemies. I know it sounds difficult. Yes, it is not difficult. It's impossible without Christ. Christ says, you can do nothing without me. And in this case, we need his help. We need his help every day, especially when it comes to forgiving those who hurt us, those who did, who did us wrong. But if we are Christians, we have to become like him. For while dying on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Two sons, two different souls, two different results. The young son immigrated to a faraway country full of sin, but he repented and returned to a grand celebration. The other son was always in church, always with his father, always religious, was much more distant from the prodigal son based on this parable. Based on this, we have to be very careful because again, his story is speaking to all of us here tonight. This triodian season, this great night, we all need to take a spiritual x-ray of our heart and try to see which one of these two sons do we resemble the most? Let us try to avoid the bad aspects of both of these sons and make an effort to come to ourselves, our true selves, which become more and more authentic and more genuine and more peaceful and more joyful as we try year after year to deny our bad self and imitate the life-giving example of Christ and his saints. Thank you for being so attentive and at this point we may ask some questions on this topic. Yes. I cannot hear. Um, can we have, we have another microphone? No? I've always Question. wondered, um, I, I don't know if I've read it or if it exists, but um, what happened to the son, the brother of the prodigal son? Like, it, it doesn't say what happened after that. Like, does he repent? Does he get saved? We don't know. Um, very, very, good, very good question. I should have said this. You called me. Uh, I didn't want to prolong this lecture. We went long enough. Um, unfortunately, the uh, parable closes without telling us. I don't think so. It doesn't say, but it doesn't seem that way. Again, you know, these passions are very difficult, and this is why. That's why Christ says in the Gospel, the, that the tax of the told the Pharisees, because again, this older son is symbolic, is symbolic of the Pharisees who thought they were perfect. And that's why Christ said to the Pharisees, 
the tax collectors and the prostitutes won't be for you in the kingdom of God. Because carnal sins are much more obvious. They can be hidden. They are much more humbling than sins of pride and vainglory. That's why it's very dangerous, you know, when we have hidden pride. God will allow a lot of afflictions because in a lot of he will, he will even allow sin. He will let us fall. Because he would rather have us fall into sin and be humble, but stay perfect and proud. One of the holy elders of Mount Alpha says, Paradise will be full of holy, proud people. I mean, I'm sorry. Hell will be full of saintly Pharisees and proud people. Very good question. Anybody else? Oh, okay. Um, why did you? Why did Jesus speak in parables? Explains it. He explains it in uh, one of the contexts of the uh, of the parables. He spoke that those that would hear would not understand, because if they would understand fully what he was saying, and they they were not ready to follow then their judgment would be much harsher. He gave them time to mature because they were not spiritually mature. This is one of the reasons. So he spoke in parables for those who have ears to hear and those that were not spiritually ready not to become despair, you know, to go to despair. They just heard a story, and I, they took what they would. And some, even some of the disciples would understand, you had to explain to them on the side, like the parable of the soul. They said, Lord, explain us, explain to us, what is the meaning of this parable? And he says, the soul is God, and, you know, so. So, he spoke in parables, just like, in the same way he said, let him who has a near hear. Let him who has a spiritual ear understand. So he did this out of philanthropy because he says in the Bible, those who know a lot will be judged much more harshly and well to me and our fathers who know a lot those who know a lot uh, will be judged a little bit more harshly than the thief on the cross and the person, you know, who just came to Christ a few minutes ago. Um, what if you figuratively have a son who wants to return to his father, and the father might be very well intentioned? and full of love, but has a tendency to kind of belittle or demean, um, and say the son might be a bit hesitant or scared to approach the father. What can you say for that type of situation? Um, Andrew, would you want to help me a little bit? I need a translation. <laughs> but uh, not really. I do understand it's just that there's an echo in this room, and I cannot really hear your other words. Maria, can you help me out? So, what was the question again? The son wants to return home. He's really worried with the father. He sometimes, uh, the father might be little him, but he does love the son. Um, the mother wants to come home, but the son's a bit scared. Is that correct? Did yeah. I?
And so the son wants to come home, but he is kind of scared how his father would react. Um, well, then the, the mother has to go between the son and the father. That's simple as that. And mothers can do that. <laughs> you know, that's a member when we're very small. And we're afraid of our, to go ask our father for money or whatever else we would go and, uh, you know, ask the mother. We'll go tell our mother and then she would kind of go and tell our father. So, um, you know, what, uh, what the mother needs to do is go and find, you know, talk to the, the mother needs to talk to the father first and explain to him and make him understand that the father is making a big mistake if he's uh, going to act inappropriately in front of his son, if it's possible, to speak to the father first, and the mother needs to go and meet the son, speak to the son, and bring him back home, at all costs. Uh, hello, uh, you say that the you know, elder son is symbolic of our relationship with, with our church today. What if the prodigal son, what if the prodigal father was found that the canons, that um, he was violating the canons and therefore um, he no longer is a prodigal a, a father? If the, if the son found out that the, uh, that the father was violating some things, Father was breaking. His principles weren't sound. His canons weren't sound. Is he still obligated to follow the father? Well, he's always his father, and the fathers are entitled to their own status as well. You know, when uh, when the commandment says honor your father and your mother, it doesn't say honor them when they're only good. It says honor your father and your mother. Period. No matter how they are. The responsibility is to honor them. Of course, it takes a lot of strength to honor a father who has a lot of problems with himself. You know, may have difficulties or may have different passions. You know, so it's difficult. But I think, by the grace of God, if uh, if the young person gets the strength, you know, to uh, from God, then he can approach and forgive his father and try to help him out. We have many young people help fathers come to church. Once you see young, young people change, they can actually motivate and help their parents to come back to church. So everything is possible when the grace of God is with us. Uh, thank you, Constantine. Lovely talk today. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, does the prodigal son give us a lesson of courage uh, by when he was down to come to the Father? And that, is that an example for us to come to the Father? But of course, I mean, you know, these, these parables are eternal. They are true in every generation. You know? And, uh, you know, this is... This is this is all you need to know, that there's no sin whatsoever. The greatest sinner in the world, the greatest sinner, no matter what he has done, how much he has sinned, what kind of nasty crimes he has done, if he repents, the heart of God our Father is large enough to turn him and he will be forgiven instantly. This is the beauty of our gospel. And this is the example that he gives us on the cross. Here we have the first citizen of paradise was a criminal. The first citizen of paradise was a criminal. The thief wasn't a pet thief. Thieves back then, they killed, murdered, they attacked caravans of camels. They maimed. This was their profession. They had gangs. And 
when they were caught, they were executed. And in a few seconds, this criminal goes to paradise. And the first person to initiate hell or Hades was an apostle, Judas. So this is a gives us great courage to know. And that's why the church places on the fifth Sunday of Great Lent the greatest prostitute of all times, St. Mary the Egyptian, who went from a time, from a life of terrible immorality to a saint who flew over the waters of the Jordan River. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we will never despair. Despair should never belong to the vocabulary of a Christian. Despair and despondency are the two greatest weapons of the devil. And we need to avoid them at all costs. Anybody else? Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, is it possible that when Christ was speaking to um, the people in a historic sense, he was kind of being prophetic to tell them that the Gentiles who were living in sin would eventually come back to the, to the flock of Christ and the, the older son who represents the, the Jewish people of the time would reject his teachings and, and crucify him? Of course, of course. I had it written down, but I didn't want to read everything, so uh, I just kind of skipped some pages. But that's exactly right. That's exactly what the uh, Saint uh, Phil Philotus teaches. You know, this is one of the interpretations. You know, in a parable, we have very, very a lot of different interpretations and different levels. So that is correct. The younger son are the nations the Gentiles, and I mentioned that the Jews wanted the Messiah only for themselves, okay? And this is why the older son hated the brother. They want the brother. And to this day, not much has changed. We are still going our animals to the Orthodox Jews, unfortunately, in New York and other places, you know, so. Um, but Christ gave many indications that he came for the nations. This is the reason why he went to the Canaanite woman. Remember when he went to the Canaanite woman? And he was preparing the disciples to show them, listen, you think you're Jews and you have great souls? Let me show you one soul. Let me show you a soul that exists in Sidon and Tyre. Let me show you this Canaanite woman. And after he called her a dog, and after he called her a, you know, and she totally uh, took, I mean, I don't want to say took him by surprise, but Christ is all knowing. But, you know, Christ, I mean, the Creator was like, you know, I really disbelieve. He says, I never found such faith in the whole Israel. And the same thing, like one of the Romans, a centurion who healed his daughter, or his servant, I think. His servant was sick. So Christ was slowly trying to introduce to his apostles the book. You know, uh, there's many Gentiles who are waiting and they have great souls. But he told Abraham, I will make you, I will make you a father of many nations. He said this in the Old Testament. This is all over the Old Testament that the Jews know very well. He says in Malachi chapter 6, 1, from the morning to all night, pray will be my name in the nations. Incense will be offered in my name all over the nations. The nations, the Gentiles. This is over and over and over repeated in the Old Testament. But they were very selfish. 
our friends, the Jewish people. We love them. We love them because of the fathers. You know, they brought us Christ and the idea. We love the Jews because of the fathers, even though they're wrong to this day. And unfortunately, they'll bring the Antichrist. But at the very end, they will also come to their senses, and a lot of them will join the church. You know the question, if not? Uh, my driver. I, I forgot to mention that I was a great taxi driver. Uh, how many of you 